So now I'll introduce uh, Janine Vandenberg, who is moderating today's panel. Janine is a world-renowned expert on the issue of ageism. Janine, take it away. Uh, thanks so much and really appreciate all of you being here. One of the things that we've talked about in Older Americans Month, especially because the theme was communities of strength, was the interest in getting people together to talk about issues that really face um, not just um, older Coloradans, but older Americans overall. And one of the reasons um, I was thrilled when Colorado Senior Lobby, um, now the Colorado Center on Aging, so congrats y'all, um, invited me to participate in this section, is that we know that ageism can really be a barrier to all of us being able to, if you will, be our best selves, being involved in community, show that strength that we have. And if together we uh, rise, to really address ageism, to call people's awareness of it, it, um, it can make a difference and it will allow older Coloradans and others to really be able to deploy the strengths and interests that we collectively have to benefit our community, our workplaces and the economy. So actually, because I am, um, Morris Price and I are going to be um, chatting first. Uh, Chris Gierkin is going to be uh, moderating, if you will, and interviewing us. And then she's gonna hand the mic back over to me. So let me introduce you to Chris Gierkin who both uh, works for change the narrative, running our on the same page intergenerational conversation program and ageism and healthcare, uh, but also is on the board of Colorado Senior Lobby, Colorado Center on Aging. So Chris, let me hand it to you and then you can ask me the first question. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Janine. And it's great to be here, everybody. I'm really excited about today's session. And um, I also wanted to add also that we're have we have guests on our panel of Morris Price Jr. And he works with the, he's the executive director for City Year Denver. Thank you so much, Morris, for being here. Thank and Cece Ortiz, Ortiz um, she is highly involved in activism and building connections in communities of color. And she's a senior advisor to the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. And so thank you so much, Cece, for being here. And Christine Burroughs, she is the Director of Aging, Care, and Connections at Jewish Family Service of Colorado. And she also serves on the Denver Commission on Aging and is certified in reframing aging through changing the narrative. So thank you, Christine, also for being here. And so I'll kick it off with just asking Janine the first question of just um, tell us more about what ageism is and why it's important for us to be aware of what, what it looks like. You bet. So ageism is basically prejudice, uh, stereotyping, and outright discrimination based on someone's age. I feel compelled to say that ageism can occur against younger people as well as against older people. So if someone has a stereotype about a younger person, oh, they are entitled, or they don't have enough experience yet, that is ageism. Ageism in the context that we're going to talk about mostly in Older Americans Month is ageism directed at older people, and it can show up on a number of levels. We know that there's such a thing called internalized ageism. So if we are looking at ourselves and saying, oh, you know what, maybe I really am too old to try that, that's, a, that's us having internalized ageist messages that we've been surrounded by. It can be interpersonal, and this is what happens very often in the workplace. So if a supervisor looks at an older employee and says, you know, I don't think we're going to give George that opportunity because he's not going to stick around long. Not only is that factually incorrect, so we know that on average, older workers have four times the tenure uh, than younger workers, but it's ageism, right? It denies someone opportunity and either way it's unjust. And I think what we're here mostly to talk about today is when ageism kind of shows up in institutions and public policy. I'm mindful that we are here with the Colorado Senior Lobby and your audience. So for example, in a couple of things, and I know these are currently subject of legislation, for example, in Colorado, um, there is something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Earned Income Tax Credit is for um, lower income working people and it allows an offset on their, uh, of their taxes. And right now, the current limit is if you are age 64, if you're over age 64, you cannot receive the earned income tax credit. Even though we know before the pandemic, one in four Coloradans age 65 and over 
was in the workplace, right? So the good news is that there are efforts there to change it. We also know that right now, age discrimination laws in the, about workplace age discrimination are not treated as seriously as workplace discrimination um, based on other forms. Um, and so again, you know, there are legislative efforts and I know Colorado Senior Lobby is involved in that. So those are just some examples of how ageism plays out in public policy. It's basically, if we are making decisions, based on age and based on stereotypes at age without looking at the individuals in front of us. That's essentially ageism. That is my short and not so inspirational speech about ageism. <laughs> so. no, well, it's important because it sets the stage and it, it's important for all of us to be aware of that. So thank you, Janine. Um, so now we'll um, go into the topic of workforce and Morris, I'll, I'd like to start with you. Um, so people often make stereotypes about generations within the workplace, which reinforces ageism. And you've worked with people of all ages. So what would you want people to know about the benefits of intergenerational teams? Well, thank you. And thank you all for, for um, being here. And ironically, given the work you're doing, uh, <clears throat> Morse Price, and I probably serve as the vice president of City, which is the AmeriCorps program. And literally in my workforce, we have our core members from 18 to 25, and I'm on the other spectrum, and I'm almost 60. And to work in that environment on a daily basis, um, uh, it leads to two, two key areas. One is context. Uh, we fortunately had someone who was with us and they've left uh, recently to pursue other opportunities who had a very different perspective. For example, this past year during COVID, um, when sites had, to, nonprofits had to go through the process of laying off or going through transition, um, the sense of calm and experience this person offered perspective in um, how to handle such transitions, having been through them before. Um, we have core members, the 08 um, recession meant nothing to some of our core members. The concept of, I'm going to have to go find another job, or how do I prepare, or just a sense of ease in an environment where organizations will have to shift. Um, and how do you address that shift? Just again, that key point of historical perspective and experience was, was critical. Um, I'll also offer the ability to kind of communicate when it came to others that we deal with, our peers, our younger core members, are dealing with the folks in other generations as teachers, administrators, and uh, elected officials, and what, uh, what advice they can offer them in driving their point. If you spend your time uh, talking to one in your own age group, in your own age dynamic, to make that message clear and having that opportunity to, to practice a presentation for as simple as presenting your information to someone where you're having to pull out the slang or the language that you're more commonly used with your peers, but getting that message across to someone who is not in that same uh, perspective. That was, we saw that repeatedly as our corpus trying to explain their work to others um, and just the value of that, that context. Thank you so much. That's great to hear. Um, so Janine, um, even before the pandemic, ageism existed in the workplace. And with studies showing that older people were more likely to be pushed out or laid off. Um, so how have you seen the pandemic impact the issue of ageism within the workplace? Yeah, so um, there's good news and bad news about that. So let's go, the good news is, and this sounds a very counterintuitive, is that because the pandemic exposed ageism overall so much, especially in a variety of public policies and how older people were spoken about, uh, being described as weak, vulnerable, elderly, day after day by very well-meaning people, um, it, um, it, so the bad part is that reinforced an image that basically increased ageism in the workplace. But, but the good news is that people have realized that and are upset about it. And it's really led to the impetus for uh, kind of a lot of drive around, we need to change policies and we need to make sure, we need to educate employers that this is wrong. And we need to be able to reap the benefits that Morris talked about, about having multiple generations in the workplace, right? So, but here's, here has what has happened. We know um, overall, so the jobs report that was just released last week on a national level um, showed that even though new jobs are being created, um, older workers still have higher unemployment rates and they're, um, unlike the past recession, um, that keeps increasing among older workers. So we know that older workers were pushed out. We know specifically in Colorado, so Changing the Narrative did a survey of Coloradans age 50 and over and how they were affected by the pandemic. And we know that over half of Coloradans age 50 and over um, 
were pushed out, laid off, had hours decreased, salary decreased. So we know that they experienced really negative effects. Um, and one about one third uh, reported that they had actually that they, they had experienced age discrimination. I often heard about it during the pandemic like this because of the workshops that I've done around the state for changing the narrative. I would get phone calls from people that I had met in a workshop saying, okay, I'm in my 60s and my employer is saying it's too dangerous for me to come to work, regardless of someone's own health status, et cetera. So therefore, I'm just going to push that group of people out. The downside is because we don't have the yeah, the public policies in place, someone would have to go through a whole complaint process, et cetera. And during the pandemic, I think people felt that wasn't um, feasible. So overall, ageism in the workplace in a way was allowed by the pandemic and by the repeated um, message that you know older people are more at risk, et cetera. Um, but if there is good news, I really see, and you know, to me, evidence of all of you here, there's really a mobilized effort of um, older people and younger people coming together and saying, this is wrong and we've got to do something about it. Um, so I am remaining hopeful. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and uh, this next question can be for, for both you, Morris and Janine. Um, so as businesses are hopefully recovering from the pandemic. Um, how, how, do we, how do you recommend that we talk to employers about the value that older workers bring to the workplace? I'm just gonna repeat whatever Morris said because what he said before was perfect. So, um, but Morris, go ahead. I think it's two, I, I focus on a, it was a scenario that actually happened in our office on perspective. We had a piece of equipment go down. It was a, the, uh, uh, someone had a copier, the printer in their, uh, in their office. And, um, our, some of our core members who were tech savvy, they were resetting it and they were literally going through the process and they were going into the settings and going through. And by no joke, the, the gentleman who was, uh, at the, was one of our older adults in our office walked up and he looked at it and he did a little look and he just opened and he said, it's just out of paper. <laughs> and that's it. Our core members were so used to thinking about the elaborate, about the technology and the systems and the unplugging, it has got to be this. And he went to the simplest process, start with the simple problem first and then work your way out. That perspective. And they literally looked at him and there was a marvel in their eyes. Of how did he not, they thought he'd analyze it. And he said, you're out of paper and you were thinking it was about the computer. So I think mm -hmm. reminded them that there's, there's value in those years and those years of experience that you want, that you can't always pay for by with just a degree. We don't minimize that because I was in higher ed. But literally those life experiences having worked from different organizations, that creates a healthier pipeline, not just a robust one, but a healthier pipeline. And that who you have in your office brings a whole much perspective, even if it's five to six people. Right. So what Morris said, ditto, ditto. But let me add a few things. Um, you know, we call it a lot patent recognition, the fact that you've seen certain patents. And so if you know a copy machine is looking a certain way, oh, the patent that triggers in your brain because you've experienced this before is that's the out of paper sound or the out of paper look or something like that, right? I think uh, we have just, so during the pandemic, uh, changing the narrative stopped doing our presentations on the business case um, because we felt like most employers were not thinking about the business case for older workers. They were thinking about how do I stay open and make payroll, et cetera, right? We are just restarting that right now. And we're finding, and I think if you've read Denver Post articles, New York Times articles, we're already, even though we have an unemployment rate, we're facing a workplace shortage. Mm -hmm. And we have groups of older people who, one, are willing and who want to work. And in many cases, who need to work um, for economic reasons. So one, we're talking about this gives you a talent pipeline. Long term, what we need, what we all need to talk to employers about is across the world, and certainly in Colorado, there's a declining birth rate. Our society is aging. We don't have enough younger workers. You know, that's just kind of a race to find. We're going to find only these younger workers. And what really smart workplaces are going to do is figure out how to fill slots really across the pipeline, but not just fill slots. They're going to make sure, and this is why some of the other legislation that's um, in, uh, in front of the Colorado legislature right now is so important. We know we have federal stimulus dollars coming in, right? There's going to be money for training, upskilling, reskilling, next skilling. 
I've heard a lot of us versus them conversation. We're going to spend it on youth apprenticeship or we're going to spend it on this. And the reality is that successful workplaces and successful companies and organizations of any type of the future are going to have a mix. And I just think it's smart to think about how do we train people together? We're going to be working together. Let's put older people and younger people together, both in training, upskilling, next skilling. But to do that, we need to make sure that some of those dollars are being thought of as upskilling older adults. One of the things that I've been really, really mindful of and I'm worried about is both on a federal and a state level, when we talk about aging policy, we talk about things like long-term care, et cetera. We don't talk about employment. When we talk about employment policy, we have all of these groups that we're targeting and we don't typically target older adults. And I think the challenge for all of us here, because I know you all by definition of being here are really committed, is we've got to figure out how we blend those. So aging policy always includes employment and employment policy um, always includes um, older adults and intergenerational thinking, so. Thank you. Thank That's you. That's what I'm that. telling people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're in it first. We're doing our first workshop. And right. then again, again of 2021 next week. Oh, good. Oh, that's <laughs> exciting. All right. Um, so as uh, community members, to kind of from that angle, how could we encourage people or all of us here and the people that we're connected with and affiliated with to think about the benefits of having multiple generations work together? What can we do just to, to spread that word and in what ways could we do that for yeah. examples of doing that? I, I think if I could real quick, I'm thinking from yeah. my own perspective, we often think about the value internally and not about the externally. If your client base is aging, um, the ability to communicate um, in that sense is critical. I went through this recently with my mother going through something that said, well, her cable. And having someone on the other side who would have that life experience with why are you doing this for your mother? Well, she's 80, she's not listening. The empathy that he provided made it so much easier to work through a solution. He was keenly aware that there was a different age dynamic on the other end of the phone. Yeah. If someone had been in designing that customer service platform, that whoever picks up that phone is not always gonna be the most tech savvy person. What value is that to your customer um, as, a, as, a, as a business? Like I said, it's not just the internal we often talk about, but the external client on the other side, as, as Janine said, when you have an aging population, they're gonna have to deal with you as a, as a business. Right. Um, yeah, so once again, I'm just, I feel like I'm here to say what Morris said. Uh, but the, um, uh, no, literally in my prior uh, Zoom call, I was in a conversation with kind of a, one of the large national nonprofits that is, I, th I think, especially um, post pandemic, think about how do we provide kind of like online tech support for older people? but delivered by older people. So people who have mastered like an iPhone and or people who have mastered a particular piece of technology, whatever it is, so that, and that also kind of changes the narrative, right? That only younger people are tech savvy. And so, and, and that was kind of part of it, but part of it was provides older people who um, still wanna work maybe part-time with jobs. It also has that sort of empathetic figure of someone who can say, okay, I'm gonna help you kind of figure this out and this is how we're gonna do it. So I think there are a lot of just solid business reasons in terms of customer base. Um, but I also think ultimately this is about demographics and strong workplaces are gonna need people of all ages. So it, you know, and, and the people who ignore that, I think are, you know, they're, they're putting themselves on a dinosaur path, if you will, so. Thanks, yeah. Um, so Morris, um, workplace changes that we've experienced during the pandemic are going to fundamentally change the way we work into the future, remote working, for example. So I'm just curious what you're seeing out there. I mean, we're seeing it right now. I mean, literally, as we talked about transitioning back into, uh, back into the office, um, I think, again, someone who's gone through that cycle of anything, any cycle at all, what to expect. And it's been my best advice to talk to my advocates and what things are, should I expect as I bring people back in on, on some of those like healthcare? Um, what are their general fears and how do I ease that? And it was, it was the person who said things like, you know, the way the room is set, um, are, we, are we thinking about someone, it's not gonna go back to the way it was. So how do we just take the time to reset it so, so it's comfortable? It's silly. Did you have a lot of plants at home? Let's put plants back in the office. So it feels like less of a transition from a, from a home to an office and just move into a different setting. How could anybody has thought about that because again of the multiple times that they've moved within their cycle. So I think this taking advantage of that cycle of, the, of that life experience, it seems so cheesy, but it's critical um, uh, to have that perspective. 
Yeah. Um, and Chris, I really think this is an incredible opportunity actually for older workers um, now, because we know one of the things that both older workers and younger workers um, really value and numerous surveys and research have shown this is flexibility and ability to work remotely sometime. And we also know that there were employers who thought that was an awful thing. No, no, you can't do that. Well, we've now demonstrated like, you know, for most, obviously not all categories of jobs, but we've demonstrated that we've done this. So I think this really is a, a kind of a great opportunity for um, older workers. And I also think that um, being really mindful of what is it that we need that actually has to be done in person? How have we all learned to use the tech tools, right? A year ago, would we have all been, you know, just kind of fastly navigating through Zoom and all of this? No, we were still like pressing the button saying, how do I unmute, right? And so we've kind of, you know, we've all learned that. We all have a facility with that now. Um, so I think it's actually uh, kind of a lot of opportunity. And again, I just keep thinking, what is the smart employer going to do? The smart employer is going to recognize that even though we have somewhat high unemployment right now, we also at the same time have a workplace shortage. So I think, you know, my optimistic self, it's going to lead to uh, kinder, gentler, and more uh, employee sane decisions. Morris is smiling. <laughs> do, do you agree or disagree? I, I agree. Again, with, in that workforce, it's the simplest things that you often forget that someone has gone through. And I'm watching young employees come through and picking a healthcare plan. Yeah. I mean, something that's simple that we often take for granted when someone has, when they, they can't just go to their parents and you have someone who's done, done this and can explain the, uh, the value and the consequence of it. It's all those little things that, um, again, that you take for granted until you haven't done it. Um, and what trust that brings in the office. And all of a sudden that person who's seen as the, for older reason, the challenge of technology, because someone you look for when it comes, if they advise about that, imagine the advice that I ask on a client issue or on a case issue, uh, because all of a sudden there's a sense of trust and respect. This person has real value. Um, as opposed to he's there, they're just older. Yeah. So I actually, Chris, um, think that that is a great segue over to our next, <laughs> since Morris introduced healthcare, it's a great segue. We did not plan this ahead of time um, over to the topic of um, ageism in healthcare. So I know, you know, you've got your master's in health administration, you've been putting together these presentations on ageism in healthcare for changing the narrative. I think you did this marathon through the weekend, you yes. did <laughs> Friday, Saturday, and Monday. Um, Share a little bit uh, with us about what we need to know about ageism in healthcare and maybe a little bit about how it shows up in public policy. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, we did a marathon of sessions for sure, which was really exciting, actually. And the feedback was so positive. And clearly, people want to talk about their healthcare experiences, is one of the overarching themes that we found in the sessions that we conducted. Um, and people are experiencing ageism in healthcare settings. So I'm excited to be a part of this campaign because it's highly needed to talk about this. And also, it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are incredible dedicated healthcare workers all across the country, and we're grateful for what they're doing and definitely need more dedicated, compassionate healthcare workers in the country because there's a shortage of them. Um, but what we're finding is just there's a need for us to understand what ageism looks like in the healthcare setting so that we can all receive the best health care and it aligns with our needs and our values. Um, and the reason that this is important, especially for older adults, is because um, by 2034, so just in 13 years from now, um, older adults will outnumber children for the first time in history. And because people are living longer than ever before, many of our systems and structures and policies um, were created decades ago. So they haven't um, necessarily all aligned with and kept up with the changing demographics that we are experiencing and will continue to experience. So that's part of why it's really important for us to become aware of you know, what does older age look like and how do we all adapt to it and how can healthcare best align with this new reality of living so much longer. So that's part of my mission in the work that I'm doing. Um, and just in as far as policies are concerned and just 
being more aware of the decisions being made. As we saw with COVID, um, we need to really be aware of the information that's being shared. Like for example, the percentage of cases and deaths of people living in congregate care settings and those with underlying health conditions. Um, just having accurate information is crucially important to the decision-making process. And so that with that, just funding programs for specialized training in geriatric medicine to all levels of healthcare professionals um, would help to create a, an improved understanding of patient and client needs. So just being aware of, do these programs exist? Can we get more training of geriatric care to different levels of providers, including um, like EMTs, you know, just think of all the different people that provide care and the different facets that exist in our country. Okay. Um, so how do you see it showing up in public policy? Health, health, ageism in healthcare? Ageism in health, yeah, showing and, up in public policy. Well, oftentimes, like what we've seen is just as examples, like the decision making process for healthcare professionals often uses chronological age to guide their recommendations. And so, some examples of like during COVID and the crisis standards of care decision making that happened, um, chronological age was part of that decision making process. And when using age alone as a criteria to determine care, um, that's actually an ageist right. thing to do. So that's not in the best interest of people. And you know, we all hopefully know that the adult population is not a, a homogenous group. Everybody is uniquely who they are for all those different factors I just mentioned. And so if we don't have that awareness and the decisions that we're making, it's not serving the people in the best way. So does that answer your question? I think I give an example. <laughs> just give, no, I mean, well, you know, and I, uh, and I know Colorado Senior Lobby took a, a really strong position on this with the crisis standards of care because there was both a chronological age and then with the addition of comorbidities that are more often found among people of color because of systemic health inequities, it felt like the state had created a system where older people and especially older people of color were pushed back would be pushed back to the triage line. Um, I guess um, I will ask you the question that you ask me, what can we all do as individuals to kind of highlight and elevate issues like this, especially where there is an intersection of age and race and gender? Um, to speak up, like that's the most important thing or become aware, like the work, the work that we're doing and part of why I'm doing the ageism in healthcare campaign is to raise awareness and help people become more conscious about what they're seeing and what they're experiencing and how much that matters. Like just for example, in the sessions that I just did this weekend, so many examples came up from people sharing their own personal experiences of not being heard or being dismissed. Just, you know, they'd go in to see a medical provider for whatever reason and present whatever it was that they were concerned about and just be told, well, what do you expect at your age? And that's very dismissive and that happens to so many people and that just cuts off the conversation right there and it does clearly makes you feel unheard and then where do you go with that so then how do you help yourself and how do you know if what it is that you're experiencing is something that you should pursue and answers to or because age alone is not why you're experiencing something so it's right. important for you know people to become more educated you know, find out what is happening, like what isn't working for you. And are there people like us that are advocates to help you mm -hmm. speak up and, you know, raise our voice, like have a more collective voice and bring it yet to the attention of decision makers. Right. Um, I, I'm just going to go ahead and go off script because this is what I do. Um, and I want to ask uh, maybe Morrissey's and Christine, because I know you all have some insight into kind of ages and how plays out in healthcare. Um, you know, maybe looking at family members, that kind of thing. So do any of you want to kind of weigh in on this question of ageism in healthcare before we go more broadly to ageism in community and what we can do about it? Uh, sure, I, I can speak from a from a research perspective, a lot, I, um, I'm the director of aging care and connections for Jewish family service, but prior to this, I worked 
um, for CU and did a lot of research um, with older adults. And one of the things that we saw in our research was um, related to physical activity and how, how mobile folks were. And so um, it, working with Janine and changing the narrative was a really great way to help speak up on those things. So um, for instance, we would have a study going on and it was for people who are 65 and older and having you know, some sort of uh, uh, surgery and, and they had to be you know, X, X mobile. You know, they had to be able to walk a certain distance or, or do whatever. And when we had issues with how fast people could walk or how far they could walk or activities that they could do, the first question out of most of our research team's mouth was, well, how old are they? And that was, which, which, you know, however fast you walk has no indication of how old you are. So, you know, if, if I said, oh, you know, they're, they're 67 or, you know, 87, that was a huge, you know, factor in, in whether we could include them in our study, which, you know, I was, I was a big uh, proponent of speaking out against that. But I mean, I think that's a really easy example of how, how ageist it, how easy it is to be ageist in healthcare. Yeah. And Christine, if I can just add a note, one of the things that was shocking to me towards the beginning of the pandemic is that even though we knew early on that older people had the most adverse outcomes, we were being excluded from clinical trials at the beginning. And I'm like, so you're going to test a vaccine on a group of people who don't, who aren't going to get it. It just, uh, you know, and obviously that was remediated, but that to me was, you know, an example of that kind of thinking that you're um, sharing. Cease, you look like you'd like to weigh in on this. Well, I'm not, well, I will, but I think that uh, for me, in terms of the work that uh, we do, we do a lot of work with nonprofits across the state and especially in terms of mostly Latino communities. And it, it weighed heavily, <laughs> this whole p pandemic was was just awful on many on many fronts and a lot of families were were, were affected by, by, by this. So this all that, that occurred. And um, I guess I would say that when I think about health, um, looking at healthcare and looking at policy specifically, I still think we are, as Latinos, we tend to still take care of our elders. So that meant the whole family was involved in this. And many times we lost a lot of elders in this process. And um, I, I feel like there, there, there's, there seems to be acknowledgement about, well, we gotta worry about you know, those people of color, but there's also, I, I, I think that people aren't really, really clear about how bad it was. And, 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 it's, and at this point, um, there has been a lot, I mean, I think just mental health wise, um, mm -hmm. what we're seeing from families, um, it's been really, really hard to, to watch them try to get back to just, you know, even to a point of, of feeling pretty normal. I mean, it's, that's our case across. I, I'm trying to figure out this new world. Um, and but I do feel like, um, from a policy perspective, we've we've got to be able to. Well, what we're trying to do is just uh, make people really aware of what's important and getting their voice into this discussion. And uh, again, I would just say, looking at in terms of this room, I can't tell, but I'd I'd love to have this kind of discussion of just around Latinos across the state. We're a very large percentage of this community and we were impacted heavily by it all um so um again from a from a, a place bob as we think about policy and change um is there ways that we could engage larger communities and i'm sure it could be the any you know any community it could be rural communities at, at that point as well you know it's it's across the board this is important yeah. so yeah yeah so thank you for sharing morris did you want to add anything No, I, I respect C's has had um, um, had such perspective. So I think I think again, I think we just saw how just the rollout of the process, um, and it would have been no surprise to have uh, folks say that the first way to do this is to get on an app and sign up um, for it because it would it would have been so simple for folks to say that's not going to be the best way. People trust who they know. They trust the community. Right. Um, it would have been me to say, if you put it in the hands of my community, that's where I'll go. Right. Uh, but again, this that that close perspective again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I think I hope that we all learned a lot for this. That we actually end up baking in future public policy, so we don't have to go through this again. Uh, let's switch a little bit to the idea of 
basically ageism in the broader community. So we've talked about it kind of specifically, you know, how it plays out at work and some of the policy factors at play, um, how it plays out in healthcare and lack of access to. Um, and Christine, I mean, you and I have talked about this before. I think we we did a PBS show on this about, uh, you know, kind of the, the pandemic and ageism uh, and social isolation. Talk to us a little bit about that sort of constant message of older adults being vulnerable, older adults staying indoors, how that manifests itself and maybe impacts on social isolation. Yeah, absolutely. Throughout the, the course of the pandemic and, you know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't really know how, how the disease was transmitted and who was um, susceptible to COVID-19, um, we had a lot of really dangerous rhetoric around, um, you know, only older people are, are getting COVID-19 and only older people are, you know, having really nasty cases of COVID-19. And so what wound up happening is we asked older adults to continue staying home, which um, led to a slew of issues, but one of them created this sort of dual public health crisis that we were dealing with with COVID-19. So we're, we're trying to navigate COVID-19, but then we also have social isolation, which is skyrocketing um, among older people and, and among younger people as well. This is not only an older adult issue. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with the term social isolation, it, it just refers to how an individual connects with society. So lack of contact with society. I think all of us could probably relate to feeling a little socially isolated within this pandemic. And so um, trying to navigate both of these crises and keep people safe um, is has been really critical. And one thing that um, has been very challenging from a safety perspective with social isolation and how it impacts our COVID-19 response is that um, social isolation has huge, huge um, health impacts. So uh, mental health um, is, a, is a big component of social isolation. Um, and social isolation has been correlated with depression, anxiety, um, lack of self-esteem, lack of self-worth. And so very important issues to tackle um, from a mental health perspective. But I think what's also interesting to me is the physical health components that sort of tie into the social isolation piece. Um, you know, poor sleep quality has been associated with social isolation, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, cognitive decline. So not trivial health concerns that are being correlated with social, social isolation um, and, and being able to navigate how we how we value older adults in our community and ask in making sure that older adults are able to participate in community appropriately. Um, and, and we all are able to participate in community appropriately while still navigating that, that COVID response. And um, I'll, I'll end this question on a high note because those are a little bit morose stats on social isolation and how harmful it is. But one of the things that I'm really excited about um, is that preliminary research is starting to come out about um, the impact of social isolation and quarantining and within the pandemic. And um, I'm excited to learn about different factors that play into social isolation. So like, for instance, if we start learning that folks who are living with a partner or a roommate or um, a family member are re reporting lower risk or lower uh, incidences of social isolation, how can we as service providers start implementing those resources and services to make sure that we can reduce that moving forward, because unfortunately it's not, social isolation it has been illuminated during the pandemic, but it's not just a pandemic issue. Or if, you know, if we find out that folks who have access to broadband and reliable internet and can access technology to continue, you know, communicating and, and participating in community via technology, if we find out that those folks have lower incidence of um, social isolation, you know, how, again, how do we deploy that resource um, to make sure that this, we can solve the problem uh, moving forward. Oh, so Christine, and this always happens, which is why I'm a terrible moderator. I'm, I'm, something that you said just kind of triggered another question in me. And, and this is actually for um, Morris Cease, um, Chris Garrick, and, and you. So there was this whole, I felt like during the pandemic, very early on, 
we recognize, oh, school children are not gonna be able to go to school remotely unless they have tablets and that kind of thing, right? So it's sort of, you know, government, philanthropic community, everybody rushed to make sure that kids, you know, had access to technology, which they should have. We also know that older adults were not only isolated, but, you know, Morris, to your point earlier, well, if I don't have a tablet and the only way I can make a vaccine appointment or a telehealth appointment is that, why is it that we didn't respond as quickly to older people? And instead, it seemed to me that some of the narrative or the conversation out there was, oh, older people in technology, they just don't know how to do it. I'm wondering if anybody would want to weigh in. And then I promise you, I'll get back to the script. But I have to I think, do it, so I'm curious. I think that's that. exactly it. I think it was just ageism around who right. wants to use technology and who has the capability of using technology. And you know, we know that older adults can and do use technology, um, but the greater community maybe doesn't believe that. And so while we prioritize students, because we had this thought that you know students and, and young people can use technology, it, it didn't translate, unfortunately. And yeah. I think that the priority of need, I mean, think about my mother who's retired. She didn't need to use a computer every single day like I did. It became yeah. something that when she wanted to. So yeah. once she needed to, the proficiency group, but you had to grow up time. And yeah. you know, I guess my favorite quote is, you can make fun of your parents for the um, your computer. Remember, she taught you how to use a spoon. It's a matter <laughs> of eventually, once the experience was there, the proficiency yeah. was there. And I think to your yeah. point, Janine, in higher ed, if we had said that two months before COVID, let's make sure every young child has a tablet. The first thing we'd have heard is, well, where are we going to get the money? Yeah. How are we going to do a rollout? Who, where's the right. pilot project? We yeah. did it in less than a month, which That's means I've said this before. This was not a lack of resource. This was a lack of will. Like, so yeah. what else we use it as resources as the excuse for our will to think differently and our will to empower a different population to say, let's just find out what if, what if we had done the opposite? What would have been the results? Imagine if we had put that up as, as you said, on the older adults with technology, then the smoother transition of the, of the vaccine would have been dramatically different. How many other lives we would have saved? Yeah. I really like that emphasis on it's about our will because I feel like that's something together that we can help generate. Cease, I know you want to weigh in on this. Well, no, that's exactly. Uh, I just want to say right on to 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 what Morris said. I think it it is about um, us. Just you know, again, when if we need this, we need to do it, and we tend to kind of have all the reasons wrong that that of why not. But we we miss that, and and it makes me um, embarrassed that I would think about what you just said, Janine. Around, well, why didn't I think about that? <laughs> you know, it's it's there, it's there. You see it, and of course, you could give it to the kids. But with with uh, um, you know with elders, we didn't we thought differently. Um, I would say that we learned a lot just with our Promotora model, which are you know uh, uh, community well trusted neighbors who uh, basically they learned very quickly how to use that tablet because that was that was a job at this point. But uh, yeah, so no, Morris, you're right on. And that included older people, right? Your promotoras. Oh yeah, oh. in fact, uh, the majority were, uh, are, yeah, were elders, right? 50 and over, 60 You've over. done a lot of community activism in this space and also around connecting generations. I, I would love to hear, Cease, what are kind of the effective things? Because we know we're, I mean, we, we've defined, I hope, for, you, for everyone so far, that ageism is a problem. And yet it seems to me that the kind of things that you're doing kind of identify some hopeful, maybe positive solutions. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you see and how can we maybe translate those cultural lessons yeah, you know, um, again, I'm I'm speaking from a place of working in in communities um, on behalf of major issues affecting our communities, of course. So uh, there's, there's there's always it's great when you have a rallying cry on something, right? So I think about a, an issue and you want to you want to fix it, you go to community, um, and uh, I would say that uh, you know our our. I have the, 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 I'm blessed to be able to work with young people who are also looking at community differently. And that, that's through a lot of work in schools that we're working with, but for them to see themselves as part of that community, right? And we don't tend to do that. Elders on the other end, we know what, you know, that we are, we're the ones that built that community, especially for those that have been around for a while. And I think that the, just the idea 
of having um, um, some space where elders and everybody else, because it feels that way, but I'm, you know, even the 50 year olds, the ones who turn 50, I mean, I'm really interested in them as they, as they kind of move into where I'm at at 70. And, but it, it's about, it's really about how do we engage community in their own work? And we don't do that very, very often. We do it, we do it through science. We do it through uh, departments of, of uh, um, you know, again, health, uh, wellness, whatever. But we really don't go into communities. And I've just, I feel like, I don't think it's so magical. It just is pretty logical and thoughtful around how, how do we engage communities in the work of, of becoming much more um, loving to each other as we think about, about the generations. And if ever there's a time, and ever if there was a time, uh, what we've gone through, we're survivors of that. And what is it that we both learn in that? What, did, what, what, what do we all learn? And for me, the young ones are really, really open to that because we've kind of given away our roots. <laughs> so and it does no color right here. It's just about who are we and how do we get here and what's our history? And all of that has happened is somewhat, um, unfortunately, uh, it is somewhat of a gift around people waking up and kids call it being woke or somebody calls it being woke. I don't do it. Yeah. I, Every time I say it, I feel like, I don't know what that really means but for me, but um, I do believe that that uh, the engagement has to start inside community. I don't care what it is in terms of any aspect of really wanting to build some awareness around the importance of, 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 um, of being an elder or knowing an elder and, and as a young person, and they love it. And we have organizers that are, you know, 22 working with promotoras that are um, 68 uh, and it, but because there's purpose, right? And uh, so um, along with everything I've just heard about workforce and importance of that, I think there's just so much potential, but that can't be done one at a time. We have to see this as, as a community, right. um, whether that be small or whether it be large yeah. uh, communities. Jenny, can I add one thing? Imagine again, when, we, when this happened, um, I think we all saw families come together in very different ways. If we did not have the perspective of older adults who had seen the development of the family the way it has, um, imagine how much would have been done. And now parents, my friends are thinking different about when they age up. What should their home look like? How close should they be to family? Um, you always thought, oh, I, I'll, I'll move home sooner or later. But I can tell you more of my friends are thinking now, including my sister, I need to get closer to family now. Yeah. Um, and not believe that I have 10, 15, 20 years. They've seen yeah. the benefit of it. I can think of two of my friends who said, I'm, I'm, um, and these are women who are professional, I'm not going back to work. Um, I, I mean, they were talking about older adults. How did you do it? And the value of it. And I think, again, it's not so much just about work experience, but that life experience of these folks that say, there's a way of thinking about family differently, and we can learn from that having mm -hmm. gone through it. Right. So I think this is taking us on a really important thread. And I'd like to, because I, I, I'm also mindful that we have people putting uh, questions in the chat. Um, I, I think Cease and Morris, you've both be beautifully articulated kind of solutions that you've seen emerging from community, right? Um, I'd like to ask Chris and Christine as well, kind of as you're reflecting back on this year and we think about ageism and, and here's where I really want to talk about ageism directed both against older people and younger people. I feel like there's been a reciprocity of us understanding the value of each other and that intergenerational connection kind of during this time. So uh, Chris or Christine, anything that you'd want to add to that? And then the last question for our panelists is, if you could wave a magic wand and have Colorado Senior Lobby champion any kind of public policy to in Colorado to uh, solve the problems of ageism and related problems, what would it be? So I'll give you a time to think about that, but Chris and Christine, you're on right now. Um, well, the first thought that comes to mind is just how beneficial it is for generations of diff different age groups to, to share with one another and learn from each other because it goes in all directions. It's not just one directional. And through the pandemic that I think has become even more prevalent and you know with connecting to each other and helping to deal with the isolation issues that Christine had mentioned you know that's one really important aspect that's come to light and also as Morris just explained how people are making um, 
pretty major life decisions now, maybe moving closer to their loved ones, changing their living situation or thinking about the setup that they have and is it safe to age in this setting or you know what have you. So those are all areas that have come into light, which I think is is meaningful, you know, like bringing more purpose to our lives and and how important connection is and about the people that we care about. And then just touching on the whole um, element that Cease was sharing about communities and that communities consist of all ages and we should all be there for one another. And in my opinion, the pandemic has really highlighted that and how important it is for us to lean on each other and know that we have people there to support us. And, you know, as we saw, lots of people came came forward to help with like bringing people food and putting all different programs together last minute and just to help one another. So we we all as human beings have that potential to, to live up to those benevolent actions. So I think it's important for us to, to do that together, like all ages. Is Christine, did you want to add Christine. your thoughts? Um, I, I agree. I think being able to leverage our work as community to, to move past this pretty dark time that we're in and um, being able to recognize the strengths that everybody brings to the table is, is going to be really critical. And I think that's something that we certainly have been able to do in this pandemic. Um, I, I do a lot of work with intergenerational programming. And right now we're working on a program with, where uh, we have students who are helping older adults with like some of the tech support piece. And we have these older adults who are at, helping these students have conversations with older adults that, or with, with adults. I mean, I think as a high schooler, I wasn't a great communicator necessarily with other adults. And so thinking about creative strategies to um, make sure that we're highlighting the skills and the value and the experience and expertise that people bring to the table is, is going to be really critical. And I think that the moment that we're in right now has been um, a good conduit to make sure that we can do that. So this is interesting because we've now articulated kind of, a, I mean, some fairly consistent themes, right? That really making sure that we are engaging community and that it is community driven, um, intergenerational kind of connection conversation. And so now I want to kind of just, and those are things that we can do as individuals in community. What can and must policymakers do? And, and if this is, again, it's blue sky, it's waving a magic wand. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Bob Brocker. I'm like, this isn't necessarily on your policy agenda right now, but what can, what can we do? What can we do? Um, and anybody can jump in to start. And, and this is specifically around ageism. If we want to reduce end age, and I really want to end ageism. So if we want mm -hmm. to end ageism, um, what policy right. things can we put in place? Well, to decision makers, policy makers, and the people that are involved in the decision making process, I would love for them all to become educated well in ageism, like through changing the narrative. I mean, we're an excellent resource to learn as much as you can about what ageism looks like, how it shows up in all facets of our lives for all people, all ages. So I think that's the first step is just to become aware of what it is and what it looks like, because then that will help better inform you in the decision-making processes that you're, that are being presented to you. So that's like my number one thing is just please become educated about what ageism looks like because really most people don't actually even get it they just think that oh it's something against older people you know but it's so yeah. much deeper than that and broad yeah. and so that's my recommendation just start there <laughs> and then you'll know what to do there you go morris how about you i'd say you know from when i ran the congresswoman's office two things one convenings the ability for elected officials to convene folks across industry across sector they have the power if a congressperson or elected official calls an industry captain and says i want you in this room to talk to someone who's in community aging they're likely to show up it's not just someone um, from the nonprofit sector asking for you to come for charity purposes but so I've always said the most powerful tool is convening. The second one is incentivize those who want to take that risk. So bringing on an older adult is not seen as a deficit and a risk, but more as an incentive. 
Uh, we saw it happen after after the recession, where there was a, a tremendous amount of money put out by the Department of Labor to retrain workers around technology when we're some of the dying industries. Well, why not do that? Why wait for an industry to die? Why not see that? If you, I really want to bring someone who can work in the shift. I know technology is different. There's an incentive for me for my to pay for that learning curve, um, as opposed to seeing as a deficit. Great idea. Fabulous. And we've got this opportunity right now, right, with the federal stimulus dollars. We got to, we have to use it. Right. Cease, yeah. how about you? Um, I, I like what everybody said, as well as I really think we need some kind of framework around caregiving. The idea that we we have to we have to help them. I mean, caregivers. God love them. I mean, my my sister took care of my my mother, uh, and my dad. I didn't, and it was it was, but it was it was it, it took it took part of her life too in terms yeah. of so the idea of and they wanted she wanted to do it. So it's, but it's just this idea that it that that there should be some legislation. I love the idea of the EITC that if we're doing it, uh, you know, for children. I mean, again, I don't even understand that completely, but I'm saying on the other side, absolutely, especially because, you know, and I would say again, uh, speaking from from a point of view of understanding some of the people of color issues, it's 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 hard out there in terms of economically. So this just any economic uh, plan that would be supportive of of elders, so that you know, if you're a woman and you're a woman of color you're poor yeah. uh, over mm -hmm. you know an elder elder and uh, that are elders and so i just think there, there has to be some other uh, some some different conversation about what it means around what what is equity around economics of this all of all of this you know how do we do this and see can i add one one, no. one, one important point um, and to both, to, I, I cannot miss that point that C said about communal living. The number of my friends who are my age who do not have kids, mm -hmm. they're not going to have that generation to take care of them. I, my sister and I none do. And to start thinking now, what does that mean when you have a large part of your sector of your population that will either be living alone mm -hmm. or, as I said, provide that support so they can live a whole life and not have to rely on who's knocking on the door, who's delivering meal services? We know it's coming. Right. And we're going to sit there and wait for it to happen and then fall in some panic mode when we start having some health and health, um, health crises. It's like watching kids of color. We knew at some point we we're going to have a change in our population. Why wait for it to happen? Why? Well, you can literally start planning and making those changes. You right? bet. You bet. Great. And I was just going to add to that. I mean, caregiving to me is another one of those issues that is across generation. I think it's about like a quarter of caregivers are millennial age, right? So it's Caregiving is affecting everyone. And that's why to me, it seems so important to move away from the us versus them. It's not younger people versus older people. It's like all of us, we need to think about this. Um, Christine. Uh, you know, if I had a magic wand and, and this is perhaps less policy related, but I wish, I wish we could have an indicator for when we're saying something ageist or talking, you know, if, if a annoying noise went off or we got buzzed or something every time something ages came out of our mouths i think you know steve if you talk to me that happens <laughs> yeah i mean i think it'd be very indicative of how ages our society truly is and i mean I, I i i'm i work so heavily in making sure ageism is diminished and, and ended but i still say things that are ageist all the time that you know all of a sudden i got to check my bias and and you know, take a step back. And so even as somebody who's working on it, you know, I still say ageist things or think ageist things. And, you know, if we were able to give that to the entire community, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so along the same lines of, of Chris's thinking trainings and, you know, we, we offer, you know, sexual harassment trainings at work and, and things like that. How do we, can we implement that in workplaces and um, and in schools and things like that to make sure that we're really, really educated on the matter. Right. Okay. We have our policy agenda, Colorado Senior Lobby. So Jody, I think you are, we're going to open up for questions now. My understanding is that you're queuing up the questions. Is that right? Yes. And you'll just tell us who it's directed to. So yes. I'm no longer moderator. I'm handing you the mic. <laughs> Well, thank you. And that, this has been a wonderful discussion. And I encourage our audience to put more questions into the chat room because it looks like we've got a little time to uh, continue this great dialogue. So 
Um, a question from Bob is just um, about the younger uh, worker, you know, our discussion around these intergenerational programs and the importance of older and uh, younger adults working together. His question is, um, what do we, what do younger um, workers see when they look at older workers? And this was probably geared to our younger folks maybe in the audience or from maybe our panelists who have had experiences talking to folks um, out in our communities about this. So that is open to the entire panel. Um, what do younger workers see when they look at older workers? Um, so I'll start, um, and I'm on the older worker side, just in case people were wondering. Um, the, um, so one of the things that I've heard a lot, and this, I actually published a piece in Next Avenue yesterday about ageism directed against younger people. Because what I've heard from younger people, and there's um, the recent report that was released by uh, the um, Global Health Report on Ageism by the World Health Organization, uh, um, cited some reports that show for younger people, about 50% of them have experienced workplace age discrimination by older employees and supervisors. So we know that ageism is, so it doesn't directly answer your question, but it kind of happens both ways because we allow these stereotypes and we even reinforce it. Anytime somebody does one of those, you know, those horrible generational stereotype um, training, if you're, you know, millennial, you're here, if you're Gen X, you're here, if you're Bimmer, and et cetera. So I think it's incumbent on all of us. So I think my, my broad answer to your question would be, there are some younger workers who very much appreciate the kind of mentorship and learning from, uh, kind of like the examples that Morris was sharing. And there are some who feel discriminated against. And there are some who just look at older people and they say, you're in my way. Um, and we know that that's something that is called the lump of labor theory, right? And very often people are pitting younger workers against older workers. But we know that every economist who's looked at that said, you know, factually, that's incorrect. I mean, if, if uh, I'm going to look at Christine Burroughs, if you and I are in the same organization and there are only two people there and you want my job, then yes, and I'm not leaving, then yes, I'm standing in your way. But writ large, um, the more older people stay in the workforce, the more, the better it is for everybody, every economist who's looked at the issue has concluded. So, so I don't think there's like a one size fits all. I think it's very dependent on the workplace they're in, their experiences, et cetera. But overwhelmingly, there's been a lot less research about ageism in the workplace against younger workers, but the research that is there shows that that is the biggest place that younger people experience ageism. Mm. Well, so we actually had a so we had a case in our in our office where the, the one of the older adults had trouble with technology, and we contracted someone who's younger to kind of walk them through the basics of it. And what we thought was a tool for some of the older adults wound up also being the exact same tool we use for people with learning differences. And so it was a nice thing to say this is how the manual should be designed for someone who just is not familiar with technology, not that they're so old they can't handle it. And it forced to think what else again within our our tools that we use. Are we not thinking about the value of someone who just learns differently, not just because of their age? Right. Yeah. Great point. And this is open to the audience too. So if you have an experience either as a younger person or older person in this um, realm, please speak up. We'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, well, think about it. <laughs> and we can always come back to that. Um, there's been a lot of buzz in the chat room just about, you know, how do we educate our policymakers, our legislators? The panel has talked pretty extensively about that. Um, certainly through Colorado Senior Lobby, there's an opportunity to, um, you know, support bills, testify on bills, write letters to legislators. Uh, we actually do a training program um, to, to teach people how to do that. I know changing the narrative, Janine, um, a lot of our work together has been around kind of that grassroots advocacy. Mm -hmm. So again, not to put you on the spot, but can you talk a little bit about the Action Network and maybe how some of these folks on today's Zoom meeting um, who are really interested in um, sharing and lending their voice around this subject matter, 
how they could get involved with that. Yeah. Um, so what I can do before uh, the end of the meeting is uh, demonstrate my tech savvy by going and finding a link to a Join the Movement Forum in Action Network and pasting it in the chat. And basically what we, so changing the narrative is, we're about educating people about ageism. We are, we teach people how to reframe message. Um, messages so some messages don't work so when we say silver tsunami you know we're the gray wave and we're going to overburden the economy that actually doesn't work and there are other messages to use instead so we do training on all of that but we also organize community so every time we do a workshop on on ageism we ask people to kind of join the movement to sign up to either be active on social media to write letters to legislators and all of Basically, everybody's name is in a platform called Action Network, and Action Network is a call to action. So at any point, we could just push a button and, you know, you could write a letter to your legislature. You could know who to call. Um, you could be monitoring. Colorado Senior Lobby does an amazing job of monitoring legislation. So part of it is mon we don't monitor legislation. Colorado Senior Lobby does that. But if there is time for a call to action, we can kind of just activate people who've said, I'm willing to testify, I'm willing to write a letter to go ahead and do that. All of us, all of us though have, it doesn't have to be formal and it doesn't have to be around a bill. Any of us can take a training on end, ending ageism and start speaking up about it. So, you know, I think we're offering our next one in June, but I think it's in, like, we're it. My, one of my favorite sayings is, we are the leaders we're waiting for, right? There's no magic group that's coming out uh, to save us. Um, it's not somebody else. We've got to do it. So we have to be um, savvy with the talking points. We need to be ready. And we need to be able to talk about the uncomfortable things about ageism. And to me, like one of the really uncomfortable things about ageism is how it played out in the pandemic. And not only is it bad to get older, but it's really bad to get older if you're a female and a woman of color. You know, I mean, there are just certain things that just became, we knew them, and we knew them intellectually, but then it was like, you know, we saw it, but we need to be willing to talk about that. And we need to be able, we need to be willing to tell legislators, you know, it's not okay that the earned income tax credit right now starts at 25, because we know younger people are working and are among the working poor, and it ends at 64, because we know people over age 65 and over are working and among the working poor. Mm -hmm. And we need to be willing to say that if we've experienced work, a workplace age discrimination, we need to be willing to talk about it. And that's been the hardest thing to get people to talk about because everybody feels it's them. And there's this stigma, right? If you got pushed out of your job and if you're in your fifties or sixties, you worry about talking about it and you think no one will hire you again. Well, if you don't talk about it, we can't do something about it, right? So I, I, I all of us need to speak up, in my view. Yeah, I'd like to add something here. So the one of the things that I've noticed in working with legislators is there needs to be kind of a fundamental cultural shift in the idea of we're fixing problems, fixing problems to preventing things. So we have a good example, um, Senate Bill 158, which we proposed last year, and Jody's very familiar with this. I mean, it came out of CU originally, and that was to increase the number of geriatric healthcare providers. So just as a starting point here, you know, we, we use the term geriatric healthcare providers for older adults. Well, our, our sponsoring legislator immediately changed it to senior citizens. Mm -hmm. So that tells me <laughs> Tells you something, you know, right there, and then um, so the bill gets to uh, gets reintroduced this year, goes to its first committee, it's passed unanimously. Now this bill calls for a, a certain amount of money this year, next year, and actually for five years, and so it got to the appropriations committee, and it's just been it's been stuck there for seven weeks, hmm. and. What we finally found, you know, have learned is that, well, one of the reasons it stuck because it calls for funding for more than two years. And this is kind of the point about prevention. So we're trying to do something that will help prevent health issues in older adults, you know, mm -hmm. by having more geriatric trained, you know, healthcare providers. And 
the legislature can't go beyond two years in terms of looking at the funding. So now, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on this and, you know, trying to get more, more people to raise their voices. But so what we're talking about here really is raising your voice. It's letting your, your particular legislator, your senator, your representative in your district of the state, let them know how you feel about some of these issues that affect older adults. And I don't think enough people are doing that. And, and in fact, I know that enough people are not doing that. So there's this kind of uh, you know reluctance to approach your legislator about specific issues, to to do something besides just you know, frankly, just complain. There's a lot of complaining, and there's not enough doing. And so this is a this is a pretty constant source of frustration for many of us. And I, I don't know, Jeanette's on here, and I, I maybe Jeanette would like to make a comment about that as well. Maybe later. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we happen to have, again, not to put on the spot, but a former legislator, Jim Riceberg, who is also on this call, who uh, put in the chat room, don't please do not send stuff, <laughs> but instead um, actually have a conversation. So Jim, I don't know if you feel comfortable unmuting yourself and providing a little insight as a former legislator. Uh, thank you very much. Let me, uh, let me just say that a legislator has arrived early in the morning. They might have had a six hour hearing they go back to their office to see what they need to do before they go home. And they open up their computer and there's 3000 emails on the computer by some organization that said, click here to send this. And 3000 people did, many of them not even knowing what it's all about, they just clicked it. And, and the first thing you do is start removing them all so that you can get to the work that you really need to do and to see the, the information where you can really have something. When I first went to the Capitol, I went back every night. I worked from seven to 10 every night to get ready for the next day. And so there's no one there to answer the phone <coughs> myself. And I'd answer the phone and all I got was hangups. And so one day I just picked up the phone and said, I'm here, please talk to me. <laughs> and so a lady said, you know, uh, well, I was surprised to, to hear a voice. And, and I said, you know, what is it that you want me to do? And she said, I want you to vote no on this issue. And I said, why? And she said, I'm not sure. I just got a message that I should call you and tell you to vote no on this issue. So we had a conversation. You know, do you know what this does? What do you think would be the most important thing we could do? If this is right, why do you think this is right? And if you want me to vote no, why do you think this is wrong? And the word started to get out. And this was a lot on healthcare things and, and nurses who were making a lot of calls. And all of a sudden, I started having a lot of good conversations with people. Because if you do it on email, you do it in any other way. I answer back, you send a note. I answer back, you send a note. In a telephone call in five minutes, you can accomplish more than you can do with 100 emails back and forth. And just sending things and saying, this is important to us and we want you to know about this, make, go, go down and sit with them in their office. Uh, between sessions, include them in the things that you do. The thing I enjoyed most was being a fly on the wall when I was invited to a, a, a meeting of some group. And it wasn't to be the speaker. It was to sit and look at their agenda and listen to the things that they were talking about and why they felt those things were important. But the problem that we have is people just don't like to make that extra effort. It's so easy today on social media just to be a push a button and say, oh boy, I did it. I did exactly what they wanted me to do. And, and quite frankly, it accomplishes very little. I had my people count those. And so if a bill came up and I had 9,000 people said yes, and 6,000 people said no. I knew that, but I had the same information 9,000 times and 6,000 times without anybody else adding anything to, to the discussion. So the, the real key is 
those people went through a lot to be in the legislature and they worked hard to get down there. And what they need now is information, credible information from people who can answer their questions and give them the information that they need. Because oftentimes you want someone to vote against something they kind of liked. You have to give them the reason why it's not a good idea because they haven't thought through all of the things that you've thought through and they don't have the experience that you have. They go down there with a, a whole lot of experience on the things that mattered to them that they ran on. But now it's up to you to provide the education and give them the thought process so they can think through the things so, so that, that they can hear you and, and begin to understand what you're trying to tell them. And you can change a lot of minds, but you have to have a conversation, in my opinion. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. That was terrific. Are there any questions for, for Jim? Except why is it so dark? You here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jim, stay on because I'm sure something will, will percolate as we continue our, our discussion. But thank you so much for that personal insight. That's, that's hugely helpful. Um, and, and a little bit of, uh, we've talked about reaching out to legislators, uh, and Janine and Chris, this again might be back to just what changing the narrative work is doing, but also for our other panelists, how have you leveraged media? How do people contact media to kind of get that messaging out? I mean, certainly um, targeting our, our legislators is hugely important, but um, getting messaging into communities is quite often done through media. So. What's being done in that area? So I'll tell you what changing the nerves done, but I think it, you know, it requires a much more robust effort than our um, our the PR <laughs> budget is. So again, this is something that I think everybody um, has to do. We have pitched stories. So um, before the pandemic, especially on workplace age discrimination and the business case, uh, we got coverage in the Denver Post in the, um, the business journal and about the business case for hiring older workers. Um, so we've, and, and about the power of intergenerational workplaces. Um, one of the things we've done is, so what we have learned is that in general, um, the media, I'm gonna say in Colorado, I've actually had better luck with national media than media in Colorado. The media in Colorado has not been that interested in the issue of ageism. And one of the ways that we got around that was we did it and we are still doing an anti-ageist birthday card campaign. So um, a local newspaper wasn't particularly interested in talking about ageism, but when we had artists from across the state who were producing anti-ageist birthday cards, meaning birthday cards that celebrate aging instead of reinforcing all of those negative stereotypes about getting older, uh, they were interested in talking about the birthday card and then we got coverage about ageism and how it plays out and got the data out. So, um, so we can do more birthday card campaigns. It, it's just been really interesting to find out that we can get coverage on a serious issue in using a tool that some people might consider not a serious thing at all. So uh, I think we got about, we've gotten about 15 stories on the birthday card campaign. And in every single one of those stories, we've been able to communicate Older Coloradans are a force, they are ignored, there's ageism, et cetera. We got a little bit of coverage on our workforce survey, which showed that over half of Coloradans age um, 15 over got, uh, were negatively affected by the pandemic. So I think Colorado politics picked that up. And, um, and also that about a third of Coloradans age 50 and over had experienced workplace discrimination. So it's, I mean, you all know this, who've done media stuff, it's like, we need to figure out you know, what's the angle uh, kind of right now that people are interested in talking about. And it's, and, and I've got to say that to me, the pandemic made it really hard. Um, we, I will share that I did right before the pandemic shut everything down, a, um, a reframing aging session with the, um, basically the editorial and news 
crew of one of our uh, local television stations, and they were all on board. This is great, et cetera. We're going to use this language and not that. We're not going to do those messages. And then literally two days after the um, uh, the state was shut down, the head of the newsroom called me and he said, okay, remember how you said don't use the terms like weak, vulnerable, elderly? Mm-hmm. What do you do it when the top state officials are using that term and you're trying to quote them? I'm like, great question. So I, you know, I we all have a lot of work to do, and I think it's all of us just, you know, and not getting discouraged. And, and you know, Bob Rocker, I get what you're saying. Um, it's not getting discouraged and just trying to enlist more and more people. I feel like this is sort of like a flywheel, right? The more people, and we are, we can see it, more and more people are getting involved. I know you have much higher numbers and members of Colorado Senior Lobby this year than you did that. Our mailing list at Changing the Narrative has grown exponentially. So I feel like, you know, eventually it's just, it's gonna turn and we're all waiting for that moment and then we'll all stop for a moment, raise a glass and then keep going. Any of the other panelists have um, experiences with the media and reaching out? with regards to, to messaging around this topic? You know, I, uh, I Janine knows, uh, oh, go ahead. Was there somebody else? Nope, go ahead. Um, Janine knows about this. I was, uh, in, uh, I was really unhappy about the, um, about the term elderly uh, being used as often as it was by um, our, our, uh, our governor's office. And, uh, Back to uh, what uh, Jim said, call when or email them. Well, I emailed him because I don't think I could have got to the governor's office, but I must have got to one of his young uh, people and um, he's he changed his language. And I'm sure there was probably lots of people calling him. So it meant that, yeah, that so I was feeling like this is good news. If you just just let them know that that doesn't feel right good to me. Right. To use that term. And, um, but it happens. So I, you know, I, I just agree with what Jim has said, uh, as well as Bob, we've, we've got it, we've got to tell our truth. <laughs> and instead of writing about it, and uh, we got to do something, do something. And that's been, and again, I have Janine as my point person always making sure I do, but I love that, because I also need a partner uh, in this work. And so it's nice to have the narrative group with, with me as well. That makes a difference. Jody, I'll, I'll say this, Janine, it's, it's a, a moment that Janine and I had a conversation and look at the strategy and it's something the press could do is who's benefiting from this myth? Um, what industry and what elements of our community are benefiting from the continued reflection of our older adults as feeble and as inept? Um, that's the hearts and minds part, but there's an economic issue behind this as well. And that's where I think some of our elected like officials can shine the light on it, certainly our, our, the media can do stories on it. Um, this is no different than when the LGBT was there, this myth based on the media. How do we show the one, that might be someone else's grandmother, that's not my grandmother. Um, so we don't need to always talk about the super senior who swam the 100 miles in the river, or the one who's so, so debt in depth in poverty, as opposed to, let's show those, 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 those I call it the, um, the illegitimate leader in the community. The one that something happens, they're gonna go to her before they go to the politician because she has more control on that block than any elected official. Um, and who are those people? So the, does the media know who those individuals, and CC knows there's always someone in those communities, certainly in the black community who, who we know who they are. And make sure the media knows who those people are so that you start highlighting who some of the players of power I and mean, change really are in those communities when these things happen. Yeah. And at Colorado Senior Lobby, we actually created um, a value and contributions um, reference sheet that um, can be used by the public, so it can be found on our website, um, that really helps to um, kind of, you know, hit home about the contributions and values of older Coloradans to, to um, not look at them as frail and broken and, and poor. Um, and so feel free to use that as a resource because I think you all will be amazed at the numbers um, that um, our older Coloradans contribute each year to the state. And we need to bang that drum uh, as well. So um, feel free to, to uh, visit our website and, and or um, can email any one of us on the board and we can certainly get you that document. Um, 
just real quickly, Janine Lebrun has a question just about um, uh, local communities and healthy social groups generating discussions around ageism um, to help understand language and impact on uh, the workplace as well as society. And I know Janine, just through changing the narrative, you do a lot of work with um, community groups. Um, so maybe a, a, another little insight about some training sessions or, or right. resources that these groups can use. So, and Sarah Brindle, if you're still on the call and can put the link maybe in the chat, join the movement, and then we can, you can get notices. So there are two kinds of kind of broader to the community conversations that we do. And one is like any group can have us just come in and we facilitate a conversation about ageism. So it's kind of a little bit of facts and data, but then it's a facilitated conversation about, and then it always ends with a call to action. So in our community, what are we going to do, right? So we've got that generally about ageism. We have one now specifically around ageism and healthcare. Um, Chris um, Gierkin also kind of facilitates. Um, we have a toolkit you can download from literally from our website. If you want to host your own intergenerational conversation about ageism, it like has everything from here's how to invite people, here's here are questions that you can use, here are activities you can do. But we are happy to come out. The, uh, in June, we so if anyone also loves speaking, we're, our goal is to train a group of people, the kind of people who love speaking and get invited to speak anyway, to be able to speak to whether they're local community groups, whether it's a faith community, an optimist club, whatever it is, uh, to be able to just facilitate this little program on ageism. So if you're interested in doing something like that, that's kind of how we kind of spread the word. So again, you know, changing the narrative has, we're trying to do this really big thing and ageism. We have a really, comparably small budget uh, to end ageism. And we, um, so our method is like, how do we think about it? How do we get people involved? And how do we have community members do this as opposed to us do it? So, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's exactly, and your name is Janine as well, but spelled differently. Um, <laughs> it's, that's exactly what we do with, like we go out and we, and again, it, you know, it, it's group by group, person by person of raising awareness about this. Terrific, thank you. And uh, this next question, Jim, I think it's back to you. Um, you're an informal panelist as a, a former legislator, so I hope you don't mind us tapping, tapping you a little bit more for some insight, but this is hugely helpful having you on this call. So um, Phil's asking, um, how do you, what, what are some suggestions to actually get um, the legislator to answer their phone? It sounds like you did um, personally from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. But how, um, in general, do we get um, legislator? How do we connect with legislators um, outside of just writing to them, which you suggested maybe not necessarily doing quite as much? I think the the key is you you know that some you never will. Uh, if you uh, get the little peak book, some of them list their home numbers, but sometimes they only list their their office numbers. But you have to work hard to try to find out a home number. They all have a phone that they talk to the wife on and they talk to their kids on. You need to find out what that number is. Sometimes if you know, for example, that they belong to a church, most churches put out directories. You can go to the church directory and you can find their not political number, their, their uh, number that they'll talk to people on. Uh, you can ask around. Uh, you can try to get on a good relationship with their aide, because oftentimes their aide will then say, hey, this is an important call. I think you should return this call. Because uh, it is hard because they're in committee hearings and they're on the floor and, and they have other things to do. And during the pre-COVID, be almost every night during the legislative session, they were invited to some dinner or, or group to, to meet and greet with. Uh, so it is hard to find them, but you need to find the ones that will talk to you and they have friends and they'll say, hey, you know, I've gotten real good information from them. I, I, I asked them to call you and please take their call. Or, or can, I give them, can I give them your other number? Uh, it, it's not always easy because they only want to give you their office number because the, the state's paying for it. And uh, they know they don't necessarily have to respond. Oftentimes it's a lot easier uh, to start building that directory between sessions. 
uh, because between sessions, a lot of people are calling them and inviting them to meetings and things, and they know that they're not going to be listening to their office phone. Uh, so it's not something that, that happens overnight, but uh, nonprofit groups could create their own pink book of special numbers to get a hold of key legislators uh, because many of them will be on interim committees and, and they're, they're around at a lot of other times and they do a lot of other things. A lot of your lobbyists uh, probably have some numbers that they can get a hold of folks with that others don't have. And so uh, visiting with, with the uh, lobbyists that you have working for your organizations and others like yours to see if they have some of the numbers that they can get through on. Because I know there are many down there that if you get a call from them, you take it. <laughs> and uh, so if you can get those numbers. The other thing is when you have a good conversation, be prepared so that if they know when, when you call that you're going to get something good, they'll take it. And so you need to be a credible source because Oftentimes, you might, you know, when I was on healthcare and appropriations and capital development committee, but oftentimes, uh, you know, we'd get our appropriation bills uh, the night before. And on Friday morning, we'd have to go through in 45 minutes, uh, 20 or 25 bills. And you, sometimes you need some information right away. And so you have to have those opportunities where as a legislator, you can call back people and say, hey, I'm not sure where to go with this one. What do you think I should do? And so if they have your number when they need information, they're much more likely to give you their number when you want to give them some, something that they really need. But it's mm -hmm. developing that personal relationship and, and not just this, oh, geez, another email. I've gotten 50 from this guy already this week. Uh, but you'd be surprised how many legislators would like to have a strong personal relationship and not just meaningless banter every time they talk to somebody. Better be less than a page. Yep. And, you know, uh, you know they, they say a, a good writer, uh, if you just want to just want to get something published, you can write a thousand words, but if you want to have somebody change somebody's mind, you got to write less than a hundred. <laughs> that you've got to get to the point. Put, if you have something to really tell the legis legislator, have it so concise, you can put it on the back of their business card. The important thing is that legislators also have to be willing to come to your groups and tell you why they can't do what you ask. Uh, I had, when I was in the legislature, I'm, I'm a consulting gerontologist. When I was in the legislature, I carried a lot of the bills around aging issues. And I had the dubious honor one time of having to carry the bill that was going to eliminate the senior homestead exemption for two years. But carry that message to all of those groups that I had been working with and explained exactly why this was necessary, why it had to be done, what the shape of the budget was, that we were gonna work diligently to be able to bring it back within two years uh, because uh, the legislature had the ability to just to, to make the rate zero which basically just made it go away. And quite frankly, when we ran that, we had support from a lot of the uh, senior organizations uh, supporting this and telling their members and selling this idea to their members that this was something that was necessary and had to be done. But we were very concerned about their issues. We, we weren't running away from them. We weren't uh, you know, saying we, we don't believe these, these are important, but this, this is important. And, uh, so it's also that it, it goes both ways. And, and sometimes the legislator needs your help to explain why something that everybody thinks would be a good idea might not work at this time, but that it's something that you will continue to work on and try to find a way that you can make it work when the time is right. Mm -hmm. Jim, when Bob brought up earlier, you know, with the current bill that we have around our um, geriatric trained um, APPs and, and a legislator saying, yes, but, you know, it's second appropriations because we can't think beyond two years. How, as the public advocating for these bills, how do we get past something like that, that hurdle? Uh, you can't. You have to write a bill that you can 
fund for two years. Okay. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what colleges can't hire coaches and give them, you know, 10-year contracts. That's, that's just the way life is today. And you have to work within those rules that can't be changed. So working in two-year increments. Terrific. So it is, the floor is open. Uh, are there any other questions for our panelists or for each other? Uh, now is the time. Please share your thoughts with us. This has been a terrific panel discussion today. Well, Jody, hi, this is Kelly Roberts with Colorado Center for Aging. I just thought I'd take this opportunity to ask Jim if he'd be willing to write a manual for us <laughs> on how to be effective with legislators. <laughs> See what happens, Jim, when you attend these Zooms? <laughs> well, I don't know that you need a, a manual, but I have given hundreds of presentations to various groups on how a bill becomes a law and how to work with legislators. And, uh, have never turned down an opportunity if someone wanted to share that type of information, then you can write it. <laughs> okay, duly noted. We just may take you up on that. Absolutely. And also as you're um, going, uh, filling out your link and pulling it from the chat room for today's evaluation, there are some great resources. Uh, so links that have been shared in today's chat room uh, some of it is what Janine mentioned, others people are sharing, uh, World Health Organization. So uh, before we all sign off today, make sure you take a peek at that chat room and, and um, download or copy some of those links that are, that are appearing. And, and if you click on the, the three dots, you get, <laughs> you get a menu and it says you can save the chat. So. You don't have to write all that stuff down. You can save it for yourself. Um, I'd like to add something just to let people know. Um, if you go on Changing the Narratives website to the um, and then select workshops, and then it will take you to a calendar. We, that's what shows the events that we have coming up and the different ways you can become involved or be part of a workshop. And so this Friday, um, I'm co-hosting a con you know conversation, intergenerational conversation about ageism if anybody's interested. And um, more planned for later this month and next month in June, I'm intending to um, do some more ageism and healthcare sessions as well. So just it's check out our website and the different things that we have coming up. Um, so I just want to do a round of thank yous. So uh, Colorado Senior Lobby, Colorado Center on Aging, one, uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, Chris Gierkin, thank you once again for being my partner in crime as we kind of think these through. Cease, Morris, Christine, I just love how when we reach out and we say we really want to do a great program and would you join us? You say yes, so thank you so much. I, I you know, your insight is so fabulous. And I really believe, so I just want to, you know, I, I feel optimistic. Ageism is a big problem. Um, I feel optimistic because I feel like so many more people are starting to become aware that this is something that we should talk about, and both younger people and older people. So I'm optimistic. I am grateful for all the work that Colorado Senior Lobby is doing and basically everybody on this call, the fact that you're here, the fact that you care about it and that you're willing to do something. So do look uh, for from us upcoming, especially if you want to be trained as someone to just speak in your community about ageism, um, we're, we're basically looking, I would love to flood the state with people who are willing to talk about ageism in every single setting. So you are the leaders we are waiting for. Mm -hmm. So don't wait, yeah. sign yeah. up now. Good. Thank you. And, and can I ask our panelists if any uh, last words? So Chris, Christine, Morris, Cease. Yeah. So I just wanna thank Morris and Cease and Christine for joining us today. Thank you so much for your wisdom and insight and helping to spread more knowledge to the people that attended today. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And I know that uh, Colorado Senior Lobby has an announcement um, of something that's a transition that is happening. So I think now is a good time to hand it back to 
our fearless leader, Bob Brocker, um, president of Colorado Senior Lobby to talk about um, the new Center for um, Aging, uh, Colorado Center for Aging. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, so a bunch of us started talking about this idea some, some years ago, actually, of changing our organization from the IRS designation of a 501c4, which is what Senior Lobby is, to a 501c3. And um, why is that important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons, but the primary one is funding. So we learned very quickly in applying for grants um, to various organizations that they don't really like C4 organizations very much. And they particularly don't like organizations that have the word lobby in their name. And so we decided, well, we need to fix that. If we're going to be able to reach out across the state and really raise the voices of older Coloradans all over the state, um, some, something along the lines of what we've just been talking about for the last couple of hours, then we needed to make a change. And so the change is that uh, Colorado Senior Lobby now becomes Colorado Center for Aging, which is now a 501c3 organization. Um, we've, already, we've already gotten funding for the new organization that we would we could not possibly have gotten under the old organization. So um, that's the biggest change is the change in the name and, and the designation. The focus of the organization remains pretty much the same as it has been, which is you know education, information, advocacy. Um, we, you know, lobby is a is is not a great word to use with funders, so it's uh, advocacy is a much better word. So, um, so that's where we are, and um, we're marching forward from here. Uh, we're we're uh, advertising for um, board members for the new organization, so that it's not just you know an automatic transition of the senior lobby board to the new board. And so, uh, if people are interested in becoming board members, uh, let us know. Uh, soon, please. Um, so that's it for the announcement. Um, I'd also like to extend my, my gratitude and thanks for all the panelists and moderators today. And we, I think we had a, a really terrific discussion. And uh, I, I appreciate Jim Reesberg being on to talk about his experience as a legislator. That's very helpful. And I think we all, we all learned a lot. And um, I, I think I would just like to leave you with, with some of what Jim said, which is build relationships with your legislators and, and not just them, but also your local city councils and county councils and, you know, whoever's representing you because they are representing you. And um, don't be afraid to engage. Um, and um, as we say in, in our, our little slogan for the senior lobby is don't just complain about politics, you know, do something. Mm -hmm. So we just ask you to do something. And, um, and that's the message I'd like to leave you with. So if there's nothing else, I think we're, we're finished. Um, hey, Bob, Bobby, somebody somebody yes. asked about our website, our new website. If, if it's up, is it live yet? Like, is it accessible? Yes, yes. yes. it is. It's Colorado Center for Aging.org. And yes, it is live. Oh. And it's very different and very fresh. Yes. <laughs> There's been, there's been, you know, it's a huge amount of work changing anything like this. So um, it, it, anybody who's been involved in basically a startup, mm -hmm. what it is, yeah, you, you realize how much work it is. But uh, we have a, a lot of people who volunteered to, to be engaged and uh, Kelly, Jody, uh, Jeanette, mm -hmm. uh, others who are on the call today are, uh, have all been a part of that. So we appreciate what everybody's done. Thanks to Next 50, you know, we were able to get that done. So um, we appreciate their support as well.